Submit it for your approval. The man in cardiac crisis is Mr. Rod Sermon, writer, producer, and agent provocateur of a certain electronic medium he helped to create, and which, by way of thanks, kindly ushered him out the door. But that is of no particular concern to him at the moment, because this is Tuesday, June 28, 1975. And thanks to a million cigarettes and a heart with its own flair for the dramatic, Mr. Serling is on the cutting edge of infinity. Mr. Rod Serling, who once remarked that he just wanted to be remembered as a writer, is about to get his wish. During a short stay in a small town called Yesterday, found on any map, in the twilight zone. States. She says there's no gorillas in it that won't sell. You know, Max, the other day I figured out exactly what I've made this year. It came to $436. How do you judge a writer, Mr. Pandish? By his checkbook? I read that thing you sent in, the 90 minute piece. What's the crazy thing about writers, Max, isn't it? You tell them you read their stuff and all of a sudden their hearts stop. Writing is a demanding profession and a selfish one. And because it is selfish and demanding, because it is compulsive and exacting, I didn't embrace it. I succumbed to it. In the beginning, there was a period of about eight months when nothing happened. My diet consisted chiefly of black coffee and fingernails. I collected 40 rejection slips in a row. On a writer's way up, he meets a lot of people. In some rare cases, there's a person along the way who happens to be around just when they're needed. Perhaps just a moment of professional advice, or a boost to the ego when it's been bent, cracked, and pushed into the ground. Blanche Gaines was that person for me. I signed with her agency in 1950. I'm only a minor league agent, but I think I have taste. I think I can tell if there's any quality to be found on a page. And Ernie, that 90-minute piece you send in was one of the most beautiful things I've ever read. Blanche kept me on a year before I made my first sale. The sale came with trumpets and cheers. I don't think that feeling will ever come again. The first sale, that's the one that comes with magic. We're going to open up a bottle of wine. We'd like to have you share it with us. What happened? Ernie just told a television play to one of the big shows. For lush or lean, good or bad, sardis or malnutrition, I'd launched a career. frightens me. Each time I walk into a network or agency office, I have a strange feeling I'm wearing overalls and little Abner shoes. New York, 1954. Between the industrial grid of the concrete and the polished marble of the penthouses is a universe in utter creative ferment. Seething. Simmering. A world that fuels the drive and passion of the artists who live and work in that controlled chaos. The heartbeat of a city. It is a world in flux. Changing. Reinventing itself. Television. The orphan stepchild of radio takes its place at the center of the storm and a new breed of writer emerges. The television playwright. Drama. Broadcast Live lifts an infant medium above the mediocrity of quiz shows and cheap crime dramas. While cutting my writing teeth, I needed the slower pace of a small town. But this is where I have to be now, throwing in my lot with live television. A bumbling, inexpert medium, feeling its way around for some reason for being.
Well, we were working in a new medium. And we... We were the old days. I, I mean, there wasn't any history. There was a certain arrogance that we all had that we just felt that we could do anything. We were all quite young. And none of us, to the best of my knowledge, really had a background in film. We all either came out of the theater, or in my particular case, came out of nowhere. We were hungry. There wasn't enough work in the theater. And here was an outlet, live television, and written by good people. There was something of the magic of theater in producing a live television play. The bone-crushing schedules, the frantic adherence to deadlines, the mistakes, the forgotten lines. But with all that incredible and marvelous commotion that attends a Broadway opening night. It could not be anything else, literally, but excellent. If it was less than excellent, a cameraman would go through a wall. If the man that is picking up the, the cables off the camera was not excellent, the camera didn't work, and then you went off the air. It was gnarly up there in those control rooms, let me tell you. I would lose average 10, 11 pounds during a show. Rob was a show all by himself in that control room. He lived every line. He went through the agonies of the damned. I finally told him, look, I said, you just can't stay here if you're going to do that. You get, oh, you know, somebody would miss a line. He goes, oh, God, what happened? Oh. And I said, Rod, quiet, for God's sake. It was a little, I guess, like uh, bullfights, moment of truth. <laughs> Because anything can happen. At three places, please. Hotel scene, 15 seconds. You'd be dashing around the stage to get to the, the next scene, which could be a quiet love scene. And you'd work terribly hard to keep from panting. <laughs> because you've been running to get there in time and hoping that the camera operator would get there too. But it was thrilling and invigorating because it was dangerous. If you screwed up, Charlie, it was curtains. Tonight, we present the 463rd play in this series, Patterns, by Rod Serling. Good morning, Mr. Maria. Good morning, Bill. Miss Serling will have to take the local. Patterns is the story of an idealistic young man, businessman, coming from Cincinnati, Ohio, to work on Wall Street with the Ramsey Company. He's um, brought in to be uh, an executive, junior executive, working under an older man. He discovers soon after that, when he meets the, the ruthless boss, that he is there basically to replace the older man. Patterns is a story of power, ambition, and the price tag that hangs on success. It is also a conflict of youth versus age. For every man who goes up, someone has to leave. 